All right. Um, so again, hello everyone. My name, my name is Volodymyr Bartis. Um, I'm working as a, a software engineer for almost 10 years already. So I'm kind of in the stage when I know that I know very little, but I've seen a lot of, uh, say, messy ways of doing our job, right? So I guess I can speak at least from that point of, of my knowledge. And I'm hoping to show you how to get rid of some of them at least. Um, and today I would like to specifically talk about resiliency patterns um, and how do we implement them with .NET. Um, but before we go to some actually hands-on and then start looking to the code, um, I'd like to ask you um, if uh, any of you can define what resiliency is. None, all right. So I'll no try to give to a- not fail right away. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one, actually. So I'll try to give it a more formal definition so that we could um, you know, rely on it every time we talk with our customers or our partners or teammates about resiliency. So basically, um, when we talk about resiliency, uh, we basically define it as, uh, or we understand it as um, an ability of the system to recover from fault um, and provide the best service possible, right? So uh, regular people, usually understand by it um, an ability to adjust easily to some change or, or misfortune or whatever else, right? Which pretty much is the same for software development. So um, you can actually bring the, this, this word and, uh, in, in a regular conversation and hope that majority of human beings will understand you. <laughs> for us, uh, though, it's mainly uh, an ability of the application or the system that we develop, that we, are, that we own as engineers, uh, is, to, is an ability of that system to recover and provide the best possible functionality to, um, to the consumers. Um, why do we care about resiliency, right? Because like, what could go wrong, right? Um, you will uh, never see any problems with network, right? Or you will never see some blocking in your database or deadlocks. Well, of course not, right? Um, you always care because uh, nothing is ideal, right? The majority of real world ap applications and systems are working in partially faulted state all the time because network isn't the same because you have uh, uh, tons of, uh, say, problems with your persistent storages, whatever they are. Uh, you always should account on the fact that failure is given. Um, there is also a statement uh, of eight fallacies of distributed computing, uh, which was formulated a long time ago, but it's still true. Um, and even first of those uh, will give you a clue why you should always plan for faults, and you should always expect that your software that you own and you build and you're responsible for um, should know how to um, still work and provide the best service possible. Um, of course, network isn't reliable, right? So this is one of the first fallacies of distributed computing. Um, latency is never zero. So you can't expect that whatever the um, request which goes through the network uh, will execute immediately. Uh, also, you can't plan for infinite bandwidth because that's also not true. And more and more, I won't go into deep details of, of every single one of them, but those eight fallacies of distributed computing are great examples why we should always plan for the uh, failures and uh, why it's important to make sure that whatever the software we are building, it's built in a resilient way. Now, whose problem is it, right? Uh, who should care about resiliency? Well. The answer to that is everyone, right? Um, typically, you'll have two main areas where you want to keep that as one of the um, focus points. First one is the infrastructure. This would include the redundancies in infra infrastructure, the auto scaling and health checks and more and more. But that's, that is what is not a topic of this conversation. I would like to talk today more about the applications themselves and how do we uh, plan for faults uh, in the code base that we build. Um, one more important thing is we should also test for resiliency because resiliency is something that usually isn't that simple to test um, because in you know if, if you don't plan for testing uh, for resiliency you will end up waiting until something bad happens on production and then you might end up in a situation when well you didn't define your um, your your um, resiliency policies in a good way, right? Um, so they don't work as you expect them to. 
and thus they are useless in the best case, right? Um, in the test area, um, I would like to say hello to Netflix and LinkedIn and many, many others who um, build quite, a, quite extensive and impressive tool sets for chaos engineering. We will touch a little bit this, this area today, um, though in um, say more localized uh, context of how do we do this in our tests, um, uh, mostly integration and unit tests. Um, and what opportunities do we have um, on how do we use our tools that we have at hand um, for more complex scenarios? So we kind of talked a little bit what resiliency is and what we should, what we will focus during this talk, but um, I would also like to suggest you some tools that, um, that I will make a part of my demo, um, which I would recommend to use for implementing the resiliency patterns. Um, which is Poly and Simi. Um, both Poly and Simi is basically a part of the same group of uh, projects. Poly is uh, quite, uh, so it's, it's uh, out there for a while already. Um, recently they released the, um, their latest release, which gave quite a bit of improvement for some of the policies, which I will uh, describe a little uh, in a few minutes. And the Simi uh, is basically a chaos engineering framework uh, which I will also use for kind of simulating faults um, and which I would recommend to use during testing um, so that you can test your policies and see what happens with, with your system when, um, when something goes wrong, right? When you get um, exceptions or when you get latency uh, or when you get some custom stuff going on. All right, um, let's try to uh, get closer to the code base. Um, as a part of the demo, um, I will try to simulate the operation of an artil artillery battery, which would consist of six hosers. Um, let me show how that would look like. So here's the demo application. Um, basically, it's a very simple one. We do have a gRPC server and we do have a client. Uh, client is a simple console application and the gRPC server um, will, would expose a contract which you can see right here. So basically the server would expose a service um, which has uh, these many um, endpoints. Uh, please don't judge me about the um, contract itself or the way that models are built because this demo is mainly, it's, its main purpose to show how can you operate with various policies. Um, so I didn't spend too much time on prettifying all of it, but uh, point is that um, the gRPC service uh, will represent the division control unit. Um, this is basically uh, the single service which will uh, simulate a lot of various faults, right? But the endpoints exposed is, um, and they are going basically in the order uh, which we will use them, right? So the first one, we will try to register unit as it is ready for work. Uh, we will try to get uh, meteorological data um, based on the position where our artillery battery is. Um, we will try to report that we actually got to a position and expect to get the assault command. Um, and then uh, as the assault command is executed, we will try to get a correction data uh, finally, as we are done with our assault, uh, uh, we will try to uh, send a battle report. At every single point of those um, endpoints, uh, um, we will see that uh, there is like various faults happening or latency gets uh, kicked in uh, or something like that. I will try to show that in a moment. Um, let me show you how the service looks. So the service itself is basically um, simple console program which um, has the um, uh, hosted service uh, registered and brought up as the um, through the IOC container for um, IOC. I am using Autofac. Uh, you can use whatever you want. Um, the policies which I will show you in a moment will work with anything. Um, the service itself would just have the uh, endpoints implemented in various, uh, various scenarios, right, with various faults in, uh, being injected. And the client application, again, this is a simple console app, um, which uh, also uses IOC for policies injection. 
um, I will spend a little bit to show what the IOC configuration is because that's important uh, to understand how the system works. So the entry point, basically one of the main classes within the console application is the senior battery officer. That's what will get all the um, commands that we will type in uh, to the console and we'll try to execute them. Uh, the senior battery officer knows about a battery, which is single instance as well. And uh, each battery has six harvesters at the beginning of the process. Um, and during execution of the commands, it could be less, could be, uh, could be the same, right? Um, finally, I am also registering the in-memory cache. I will show why in a few, few minutes. Um, I am registering the gRPC client so that I could communicate with my division control. Um, and finally, I am registering the default policies. Those will uh, basically describe how exactly we will react to faults. Um, so let's try and see uh, where, like, where do we actually need to react to some faults, right? The first thing you would do as the senior artillery officer, you would try to get your 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 battery um, in a ready state to execute whatever the command is, which would be a two arms command, um, which we will see not working very well, right? Let's see what what is happening here. Here's the um, before I continue. Can you all read well, or should I try to make it a little bit bigger? All right. All right, cool. So um, based on the log, what we can see is uh, we got our six howitzers to the operational state, though it happened within two seconds. So let's consider this as a little bit too much, right? Uh, the second thing is we tried to register our unit as we got ready uh, with the division control, which didn't end up well uh, because of the timeout. And then finally, uh, we also attempted to get the Meteo data, which also failed because of the timeout. So the, th this is something that we would consider a transient fault, right? Meaning that it shouldn't uh, happen all the time, right? So the natural um, attempt to fix it, it would be to try, that, try the same thing again. So let's give it a try. Um, and um, before I move on, let me remind myself commands. So the first thing we will try is we will try to do a basic retry on our RPC fault. Let's see what changes. So again, we are getting our howitzers this time they get got ready way faster, but um, then we tr when we try to register unit and get Meteo data, we are using a retry policy, which is basically trying right away again and again and again, right? Eventually, we succeeded to get uh, uh, Meteo data and to get the uh, repositioning command from our division control, so we succeeded. But uh, let's talk a little bit if this approach is good enough in a real world, uh, world application. So we executed retries right away after the failure. Um, in a real, real world application, most likely this is not a good strategy because if you are retrying over and over again and your um, third party that you're communicating to is at this moment overloaded, uh, uh, then you're not doing anything good, right? You're actually uh, trying to, like you're just causing a denial of service out there, most likely. You're putting more and more pressure on the third party and there is no guarantee that it will be able to respond. Moreover, you can end up with that third party being down at all, which isn't a good idea, right? Um, so how do, we, um, how do we change our approach here and how do we mitigate that? The other strategy for retries, which is commonly used, is a retry with the exponential backoff or any other kind of a backoff. Idea there is that as the request fails, we will try again, but not immediately. Uh, well, first time maybe immediately, but uh, if it fails more than that, we will try after some time, after a delay, right? Let's see how that works. Uh, we will use an exponential backoff strategy um, and it will be, um, it will look um, like this, whoops. So you can see this this time you, you will see the time spans. Uh, basically, this time span is amount of sleep between the initial like the previous attempt and um, uh, and the retry. 
Um, so you can see that first time we are retrying after a second, then two seconds, then four, then eight. Uh, and finally, we got our responses as we expected. All right, this is probably better, right? However, if your application or your service uh, works with a huge load, right, when you have thousands of requests per second, uh, or maybe even hundreds, it might not be a great idea because basically what you're, what you will, uh, like if this policy is shared across all the request executions, what will happen is whenever you retry all those requests, you're causing a spike on the third party because uh, they will get a spike of hundreds of requests after a second, then another spike of the same, la of the same size, uh, most likely of, uh, in two seconds, then again a spike in four and again a spike in, at eight. Right, so it probably like it, it reduces the chances that your your third party is able to reply to you within within a reasonable time frame because you're causing uh, those spikes of workload on them, uh, which if we are lucky doesn't lead to that third party failing completely, but it also probably doesn't lead uh, to you getting the the response in a reasonable time frame. So how do we mitigate that? The answer to this is basically a decorrelation of the retries. What this means is we will try to flatten the curve and instead of sending all of the requests um, at the same time, uh, at each retry, we will try to send them uh, at a random, with, with a random deviation from the uh, retry median. Um, let me show that with an example. It should probably be a little bit more clear um, on what's happening. So let's try with jitter. So this retry, this retry policy is usually called as a decorrelated retry with the jitter. Uh, and what jitter is, is a random deviation from the, um, from the retry time span median, right? So we would take the second and then try to add a random number of milliseconds to it or remove, like subtract a random milliseconds from it. And then this will flatten the curve and it will reduce the load uh, it will reduce the amount of requests that your third party will get from you at the same period of time. This will increase amount of, um, like it will increase the probability of you getting a response after all. Um, all right, so suppose we manage to get rid of the problem with the, uh, with the timeouts, right? Um, however, there are two more things that I would like us to address in, as of this part of the exercise. So, uh, we saw that we're getting Meteo data, right? Uh, well, in real world, Meteo data isn't something that changes very frequently. So maybe it doesn't make sense to, you know, to ask for it um, again and again and again, every time that we need it. And we need it to, uh, to calculate our firing parameters so that we can actually hit the target. So let's give it a try and let's try, try to cache the data for, for us. Um, so for that, we will use the memory cache. Um, and that's how it will look like. So when we try to get Meteo, um, we will try to take a look at the cache uh, in memory if there is anything. If there is nothing, we will try to get the uh, cache from the endpoint, which happens within the retry policy, which I will show in the code base in a few minutes. Um, and as soon as we successfully get it, uh, we will just put the data into the cache, which sounds fine. We can reuse that data afterwards, uh, but there is also another thing that I would like to address before we actually go into the code base and see what's happening. Um, we saw that our hosts are reporting for duty sometimes within milliseconds, sometimes within two seconds, which sounds like they're not very stable in that aspect. So maybe some of them are too slow, maybe not. And as the military unit, you need to act fast. And um, given one of your howitzers didn't respond fast enough, which is say 500 milliseconds for sake of example, uh, we should probably forget about them and um, say, all right, if, if they will be ready in like a second and a half later, we don't really care about it. We will just abandon them where they are and we will try to, um, uh, to complete our assignment uh, and our our tasks that we will get from division control um, with remaining howitzers which were ready in time. So um, for that, we will use a timeout policy. Um, hold on, it's default. 
uh, pessimistic timeout. So what, what changes is like this time we got lucky, you can see that we uh, managed to um, get all of them ready within seven milliseconds. Um, let's try another time so that we can see it in action. All right, so here's what happens. We got four of our howitzers ready in time, then the timeout happened and we got four howitzers ready for work. We got the cache, got the Meteo data from cache, and within two retries, we reported eventually to the, um, even, yeah, within four retries, we reported eventually that we are ready to work, right? However, notice this in the log. The Hoser three and two, which were not in time, actually reported eventually that they are operational. This is important and let's see why. So let's switch a little bit uh, deeper into the code and see what exactly is happening. So as I said, the senior battery officer is what is responsible for all of this that we are typing in. Um, and here's the two arms command that I'm using. Um, all, of the, all the parameters and options that we defined in the command line uh, are basically the policy keys that I'm using for resolving uh, the policies from the policy registry. Um, from uh, which is registered with uh, my um, IC container. And this policy registry contains uh, various policies that I will execute uh, my delegates within them. Uh, those would be, in our example, the retry policies, the cache policy, and a timeout policy. I encourage you to find your own way of registering policies and defining uh, your registers. Reason being, um, at every single application, the way you register them and the way you reuse policies is very, very different. Um, for example, when you are defining policies for say all the gRPC calls or all the HTTP calls, uh, then you will probably want to uh, define such policies somewhere in some shared place where all of the policies could be reused uh, at any time. Um, however, if you are doing that on spot for a very specific scenario or when the generic policy isn't good enough, then you'll probably do a registration or a creation of the policy in line. Or you could, could resolve it from a different policy registry or something like that. I am using a very simple policy registry, which is uh, actually built by Poly. Um, and it uses string keys to uh, get the policy from the registry. Um, so let's see what, how, the, how do we define policies first, uh, all which, which I have shown you earlier. So here's the uh, policy container extensions, which I'm using to register the uh, policy registry, here it is, to the uh, ISC container. Um, I have this large, large list of uh, policies defined here. Uh, all of them are defined by a policy keys. Um, and this one is the very simple and where you would use it is whenever you want to test what happens if there is no policies at all, right? Uh, so this policy literally does nothing. The only thing it uses, it, it could be used for is for testing and uh, for experimenting when like what happens if, if no policy is involved. Now we saw the basic retry policy and here's how do you define it. So you'd say, all right, basic retry policy should handle a specific exception. And when this exception happens, we will go ahead and try uh, again up to maximum retries. And whenever the retry is happening, uh, that's what we will do. Um, so this describes the policy itself, but how do you use it? Let's switch for a second back and see, like, this is the retry policy, which I just showed you. Um, how do you use it, right? I have a code which goes to the uh, gRPC server and tries to register my unit with the, with the division control. Uh, and I want it to be executed within the policy. So here is my retry policy. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, policy, execute and capture asynchronously this part. This, this, this code, which, is, which I have here in, in a delegate. Uh, you can define or you can get, like you can optionally define the context. I'm doing this so that I could get some meaningful operation keys and log it into the console, but you can skip this um, if you need it. Uh, but basically what happens is that whatever I have in this register async will be executed within the policy. So say if my register async uh, right here does the remote call to the gRPC server and it fails with an RPC uh, exception, what will happen is my policy, uh, which was defined right here, will handle the RPC exception and will retrial of it. 
So this is a very dumb approach to uh, defining a policy because usually you want your policies to be more fine-grained, meaning you want to, them to handle a specific kind of exception or more than one exception or maybe even a result which actually has some value, right? Maybe none of the exceptions were thrown, but you still want to treat it as, okay, I need to try again. How would you do this? Um, you would say handle, and if you want to handle a very specific exception, you would define a parameter here saying, okay, I want to handle a specific exception, uh, which, which, should, um, which should satisfy the predicate. Um, for example, saying that exception should have a status uh, with uh, status codes, which is equal to um, say canceled, for example, or uh, in our case, that would be um, deadline exceeded, right? So that we actually are handling timeouts. Maybe you want to, in addition to that, maybe you want to uh, handle other kinds of exceptions. So you can um, easily do this with uh, um, extension methods like or uh, or inner or result, and define your own predicates, which will identify when exactly this policy should kick in. All right. So this is how you use the policy, and this is how you define it. Uh, but we also used like more than just this basic retry in RPC, which was basically retrying uh, again and again and again immediately. How did we uh, arrange the exponential back off? So this is again a retry policy used with uh, not a bare bones poly NuGet package, but a poly, poly trig package, which ex which um, gives you a little bit more handy extension methods. Um, and, and like which um, and a st static methods as well on on the policy class um, to actually go ahead and um, and define your policies in, in a more uh, sophisticated way. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, I want to wait and retry asynchronously on the RPC exception, and uh, I want to do that uh, based on the uh, specific sleep durations. So this back off exponential back off uh, method will return us. Uh, an enumerable of time spans. And every time I do a retry, I will pick <clears throat> from that I enumerable um, the time span uh, for to, to use it as a sleep duration uh, based on the max retry. So if, say, if it was a second retry, I will, I will pick a second um, time span from that in, uh, I enumerable. Um, and this exponential back off is basically says it basically says that first uh, delay would be a second, and then I want you to generate the exponential back off based on the max retries. And by default, it uses the um, uh, the um, like if I recall it correctly, it's basically a power of uh, power of two uh, for defining the the back offs. Um, all right, uh, the on retry async we are basically using the same um, the same delegate as, as previously to report the operation key, the timestamp, and what was the retry attempt. Now, the last but a very important one is the retry with jitter. What happens here is we also use this wait and retry async, though important thing here is that we define our durations for sleep not as an enumerable as we did for exponential backoff, but we define it as the delegate. Why is this important? Because Say we defined our uh, our collection of uh, sleep durations, right? Our time spans for sleep as the decorrelated jitter back off. That's what 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 like th this handy method allows you to use this decorrelation, which flattens the curve and you g helps you get rid of spikes, which I mentioned earlier. So, what if I just do the same thing as I did right here? What if I just get this data and say, all right, here's your sleep durations. Every time this same policy is used for all the requests, right? Um, you will end up, every single request will, will grab um, at, at the, same, the same sleep duration. So you are actually changing your sleep durations to be not defined by the exponential, um, by the exponent, right? Uh, it's, it gets the random deviation from the median, uh, which is one second on the first retry. Um, but eventually all of the requests which are executed with, within this policy will use exactly the same sleep durations. So in fact, you're doing nothing different than you actually did right here with exception of the way that you define those, um, those um, times for sleep, right? Instead, if you want to actually decorrelate them and make sure that you actually flatten the curve and you do not cause spikes, what you should be doing, you should, every time that policy is executed, you should recalculate those back off spans again. 
so that for every single request that is executed within this policy, the time spans for sleep are different. That is important thing to do because otherwise, if you define uh, your policy exactly the same way as here, you will not achieve any different result than, than um, you do with an exponential back off. All right, now the other one, the simple one is the in-memory cache that we used. Again, this one is very simple to configure. Basically you say, hey, Polly, I want to, to construct a cache policy. And uh, it will require you to give you, like to provide a cache provider. Here it is. The cache provider is, is required to implement the ISN cache provider interface. Uh, which is quite simple. Um, so it's not a big deal to implement it for any of the cache providers that you want to use. I am using an in-memory cache here. Um, you can use anything. You can use Redis, you can use whatever you want. You can use um, Azure, um, you can like literally anything. Uh, but the question is why do I use this cache policy if uh, the SDKs for the same Redis and other, other um, cache providers can give me a lot, right? Well. I would recommend to use this policy given your cache provider doesn't have native um, cache, cache aside policy, meaning that it doesn't allow you to automatically place something into cache uh, when you got, got your data from the, um, from the data source and doesn't allow you to update your cache as you're updating the data. You can easily achieve that by basically implementing uh, this read read through and write through um, strategies on, on these delegates, right? Basically, okay, what do I do when I'm getting something from cache? What do I do when I missed, missed the cache? And what do I do when I'm trying to put something into cache? What should happen when uh, I got an error on retrieving data from cache or putting it to cache? So it gives you quite a lot of flexibility and it also allows you to define the time to live for cache, which is one of the most important things because caches are probably one of the hardest things um, when, when, when we were building software, it's very hard to uh, configure it properly and figure out what, what should be the time to live, what should be the condition for invalidating the cache value. You can define a uh, time to live as a time span, or you can define uh, a different strategy for identifying for like how long this this um, this cache record should live. Um, and Polly will take care for uh, for you for either grabbing the data from the cache or getting to the data source and then automatically placing something to the cache as you get the data from it. All right, finally, the default pessimistic timeout. Um, why it is important? Well, let's first see what, what, how do we use it, right? Let's switch back to our senior artillery officer and find our two arms. So what we did is we got the retry policy, we got the cache policy. For Meteo data, we said, okay, we need to do retries because it isn't reliable and we will also want to cache all the data because um, it, it's probably something that we can reuse so that we don't have to uh, ask for, for Meteo data again and again. How do we combine policies? Poly allows you to define a policy wrap as simple as right here. Uh, the only tricky part is that it's, it's like, on my taste, it isn't very explicit on what is the outermost policy. So you have to rem remember that this is the innermost policy and to the left you get the outermost policy. So first this gets executed and then when it is successfully executed or not successfully executed, it will get uh, back to your cache policy to the, to the left. So we have defined, uh, like we got the defined retry and cache policy and we also defined a policy wrap. So um, let's get, get some use from them. Um, you can see that we pass the timeout policy key to the battery two arms method. I will show why in a second. But as you, our battery gets ready and as it is ready, uh, what happens is we say, all right, Meteo policy execute and capture asynchronously the uh, Mete get Meteo request to our division control service. And what happens there is we try to uh, send the get Meteo request. When it fails, we retry again and again and again up until it is successful, uh, given it's successful within five retries, which is a max cap here. Um, and as it is successful, we are just getting the response and placing it to the, uh, to the cache using um, the, uh, the, the key, which is a coordinates of, of where exactly are we. 
Um, and then the same thing is with the registration task. The only thing different is that we actually using a retry policy instead of this policy wrap. So as you can see, using policies and wrapping them is quite simple. However, the complication we will meet when uh, we use the timeout policy. So here's why. To ARMS, basically, I moved the policy registry um, and getting policy from it to the battery class just to keep the previous one small enough and simple enough. But here is why it is a problem. You can see that uh, as we say battery to arms, which is a part of a command, uh, we have to make sure that every howitzer started the same thing. Like they started getting operational. So they also execute the to arms uh, method. And what we are doing, we say, okay, we have to wait until all of them are ready. So if you don't use any policy, we will wait until all of them are ready. And that's where we saw that it had, takes like two seconds, sometimes more. So with the timeout policy, we say, okay, um, if, if we are not ready within 500 milliseconds, then uh, we will just remove from uh, the internal list of how it starts those which are not ready, and we will just abandon them. We don't care what happens to them. Um, now, you can see that there is no cancellation tokens here whatsoever. So what that means is we are working with the pessimistic timeout. Uh, there are two, two types of policies for timeouts. One is a pessimistic one when you can't cancel whatever you were executing inside and you're just walk away from what's happening uh, within the policy, right? Um, and there's the, the optimistic one which works uh, assuming that whatever happens inside of your policy within this delegate um, is basically using the cooper cooperative cancellation, which means that you actually um, implement that pattern um, as recommended by Microsoft and you actually have a cancellation token and you check for it. And at some point you actually cancel something and stop processing your tasks. Um, so why it is important that we don't use the um, the Cancellation, cancellation talking here and that we are using the pessimistic timeout policy. Because if you if you would go and had and use an optimistic one, you would still wait up until all of them ready right here. That's the way the optimistic policy is implemented. It still waits. Now, how do I, so say I, I have abandoned in our example, two of six tasks, right? Two of six howitzers were abandoned. Uh, though maybe within that task, I had something that I have to clean up. Like maybe I had to dispose some resources. Maybe I had to, uh, well, at least as a bare minimum, you would like to to have uh, in real, real world applications, you would like to, to have some monitoring in place. You'd need an observability that something was not executed in time and it was finally executed or not executed or, or failed or canceled. How do we do this? An example of it um, is basically right here. So this is how do we define the timeout policy based on the pessimistic timeout strategy. So we say, all right, the timeout policy will timeout after 500 milliseconds and the timeout strategy would be pessimistic and on timeout, well, this is important. So we grab a task which is executed within our delegate. So that's, that's exactly what we are executing. Uh, and we create a continuation task for it so that we can identify when the whole task is finished and if it is faulted, if it's canceled, uh, or if it was successfully finished. And, and like we don't really care which one of those three, but at the end of the day, we still want to clean up any resources if we have any that, that require the cleanup, right? So this is important to define this at least for the observability and, and monitoring purposes because you know you want to know what happens in production with your tasks especially if you're using the pessimistic strategies important thing to remember is that you should never ever await this task here because otherwise this policy becomes useless because it will await this continuation task at the end of the day um, all right i hope this isn't too much uh, if you have any questions so far let's um, talk about them. Otherwise, let's do a little recap. All right, I'm guessing no questions so far. I will hope that it was crystally clear, right? Um, all right, so let's do a little recap. Retries, when to use them basically on transient faults. Um, variations of the retries, it is the immediate retry, which probably sucks the most the retry with the back off, 
Um, you can do linear, linear back off, you can do exponential, you can define your own uh, and retry with a back off and jitter, which I would recommend personally, especially if you have a lot of requests going on in, in your system and going out of your service or application to the third party. Um, basically a back off with the jitter will decorrelate your um, your requests and make sure that you're not causing spikes of the load for the third party that you're talking to. Um, the most complex things with all of these policies is how do you find the right configuration? What should be the, the sleep um, durations? How many max retries will you do, right? And so on. So I don't have a good answer to that. The best answer I can come up with is this is something you have to test and this is something you have to answer on your own because it significantly depends on what your systems are um, and uh, what your hardware is and what are the loads on your systems at the specific amount at the specific moment of time. So unfortunately, this is something that you will learn in a hard way, either through the load testing or right away on production. And I would actually prefer the first option, even though it's way more, um, it, it costs way, way more. All right, um, let's recap what the timeouts are. The timeouts, um, those should be used when we are using long, we are working with long running operations, which do not have built in timeouts, uh, or which do, but this default timeout, uh, which is built in, is defined like uh, with the general policy, like across the whole system. And for a very specific uh, case, you need a different timeout con um, configuration. Um, there are two variations to strategy is optimistic and pessimistic. Optimistic relies on the cancellation token. I will get back to it in a few minutes and show that in action. And the pessimistic doesn't rely on any cancellation tokens. It just walks away. Um, additional considerations is basically always think about ab abandoned tasks. Any actions which are abandoned, well, you probably, like I would strongly recommend you to um, see what actually happens with them, because other, otherwise you might end up with, in a situation when some records created in the database or some requests went out, which you never know of because you abandoned them and you said, all right, I don't care about what happens inside of that task, which can lead to hours and hours trying to figure out what's wrong with your, with your system. So please do the continuations and log uh, both successes, faults, and cancellations for those tasks. If you have any resources that you need to clean up, do that. Uh, and in case of the pessimistic uh, strategy, do not forget to not await that continuation task, otherwise the strategy will be useless. Final uh, part, which I would like to uh, talk on, as a part of recap is caches. So when do we use it? When working with the relative, when we are working with the relatively static data, when cache doesn't have, when the cache provider, which we use, might it, it might be Redis, it might be memory or whatever else, um, when this cache doesn't have a native read through and write through support. Um, and what I would recommend you to consider is to implement a distributed cache as um, like as shown in the picture, which is very simplified, but still should be good enough to understand. Basically, when you have more than a single instance of your application, uh, you probably don't want to keep caches in every single instance of it. So in memory might not be the greatest idea. Um, so you'd probably want to use some uh, shared cache services. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I would like to recommend you to think of. To implement this, you will spend way more time and it will be way more complex, but the uh, leverage of it would be uh, that your, your caches are actually way more effective. All right, um, any questions so far? None, all right, let's move on. So um, we saw how the retries and caches and timeouts work, um, but let's get back to our console application and see what happened. So we reported for duty, we got the repositioning command and we got the Meteor data. So let's see, let's try to reposition. Um, let's define where to. Um, and in addition to that, um, as a part of reposition, what ha has to happen is we need to change our position, report to division control that we actually changed it. And finally, we need to get uh, the Meteor data. Um, so since we cached our Meteor data, it might be a good idea to use still in memory cache. 
And since we are going to talk to the same division service, then probably it will require us to do some retries. Um, actually, let me just copy that command because I have very bad memory. So we will do again retry with the jitter. So you can see that we got our meta, we tried to get our metadata from the cache, but it, it, uh, we, we had a cache miss because the time to live on the cache was five minutes, which definitely expired because I'm talking a lot. Um, and uh, we actually tried to get the Meteo data again, and we succeeded on the fourth, re uh, on the on the fifth retry. And then uh, we placed that data into cache again, and we got lucky. And in position uh, command was successful from the from the second attempt um, because targets were out of range for some reason. Um, and we, since our retry was handling all the RPC exceptions, we did we did retry again, and we finally got our assault command. So nothing new so far. Let's try to do an assault. So what what the assault command means is your battery has to to aim, your battery has to fire, and your battery has to then ask for a correction. Important thing is that since you are in position to actually bring havoc to the target, right? You have to move fast. So if if your um, aiming takes longer than you need it to, then you probably should just not wait for it. Uh, the same thing with firing, you can't afford to wait for too long and up until you are done with uh, the default value of 40 ammunitions uh, per one firing command. So that's where we will obviously imply the timeouts say, okay, if you are not done within say 500 milliseconds, then just not even try to fire if you are not firing uh, fast enough, because say your your hobbits are getting too hot, um, then well, do what you can, but after the 500 milliseconds, just stop, right? So don't try to, to use all the ammunition that you have. And finally, when you're done with that command within the second, uh, one second period, right? Two timeouts, um, then we will try to get a correction. But what if we can't? So let's see what happens with the assault command without any, um, any policies implied. Um, so we will do assault uh, and we will define the latitude, longitude, and the main firing direction. And I forgot to remove a space, actually two spaces. All right, so you can see that the whole thing takes too long. Right, this time we were able to get ready to fire, like to, to do the aiming within 12 milliseconds. But then while we were firing, we ended up with our howitzers overheating and we had to wait for a cool down. And then that means that our firing was done after three seconds. So most likely we are in trouble because we could have gotten ourselves in uh, under the fire, right? So we should imply the, we should apply there the, the timeouts. And then finally, when we tried to get the uh, correction, we were not able to get that correction. Um, and so if you don't want to get in trouble again and get on yourself and your battery under the fire, you, you will try to fall back to a different position and um, um, try to actually report that new position. If you are successful with reporting that position, you might get another assault command. If you're not, then, well, um, things happen, right? Then you probably want to disengage your battery. So let's try this again, um, this time with policies. So we will use for firing and aiming, we will use default uh, optimistic uh, timeout. And for corrections, we will um, actually, let's use the same. And let's see what's happening there. All right, so we had three howitzers ready, um, but the fourth one wasn't. And since we are using optimistic timeout, the aiming for it was canceled. I will show that in the code base in a second. Um, and then we are uh, trying to fire. We are waiting for cooldowns because they happen again. Uh, but as soon as we are done uh, with our timeout, like 500 milliseconds, we will say, all right, we are done with firing, right? So this time it's like 514 milliseconds and 13 milliseconds. I am counting that using stopwatch, which you shouldn't be doing when you're doing your performance monitoring, but it should be good enough for the demo purposes. And the ammunition consumption, you can see that this time it's way different. So we had 40 per howitzer earlier, and then three of the howitzers that were firing got 25, 15, and uh, 24 correspondingly because of the cooldowns. 
Um, finally, again, we tried to get a correction. We were not successful. Uh, as you can see, the, the exception which was thrown is that the request was canceled. Uh, so what happened is that we used the same default optimistic timeout here. And uh, since we didn't get the response in time, we canceled the request to the remote service. Um, and we changed the position. We tried again to, uh, to report it, but um, we're not successful with it. Uh, let's try this time with the pessimistic timeout and see what happens. All right, so this time two hosers were ready. Um, and here you can see that um, they, like th this hoster from the very beginning, didn't, wasn't able to um, shoot anything, right? And then to fire anything, then the fifth one um, on the second attempt on, of firing wasn't able to either. And these two actually did some firing this time. Now, uh, again, we couldn't get any correction and this time the exception is a little bit different because of the different strategy that we picked because we were not canceling the gRPC request, but instead we throw uh, the timeout exception from the policy and we just walked away. And the fact that that operation was continued, you can see right here, that's the end of our uh, request, which also was failed because of the uh, service sending us the fault. So this is the main difference, like the default, um, the, the pessimistic uh, timeouts will just walk away um, and, the, and throw the timeout policy exception. Uh, the optimistic ones uh, would try to cancel uh, whatever, whatever the operation was inside, expecting that your, your operations, which you supply to the delegate, are actually using cooperative cancellation. All right, so let's see how it is implemented. Um, and see the, uh, okay, reposition, we don't really care about it. Here's the assault. So the assault does uh, the following. Uh, it calculates the angles uh, based on the uh, direction deviation, target um, latitude and longitude, and then we try to aim based on those angles and the timeout policy, and we then try to fire 40 ammunitions each, again, based on the same timeout policy. Those timeout policies again are taken from the taken from the same poly, policy registry. Um, the other thing is that we get the timeout policy for correction, which you saw we switched from optimistic to pessimistic in two different examples. And um, um, this time I wanted to show how do you define your policies in line, which is basically the same thing as you would do with the with the um, with your uh, policy registry. So you just define it exactly the same way. So you'd say, all right, policy handle RPC exception um, or timeout rejected exception. And then when this happens, do a fallback. This is another policy which I wanted to show you. Basically, you can apply it to whatever it is. Like any of these policies we're talking about are applicable to any kind of delegate. You can do a, a remote request there. You can do some business logic there. You can do, um, say, SQL queries, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, in our case, I am using a fallback policy saying, okay, if these were the reasons that something in the delegate that I'm using uh, went wrong, right, I will try to execute this fallback action instead, which in our case is basically defining a new uh, boundaries um, and repositioning to the random place within those boundaries. So this is what, what happens if I failed to get a correction for some reason. And then as we reposition, we will try to get a new, we will try to report our new position to the GRPC server. If that fails, then, well, this fallback crashes again. So I will define another policy, which is also a fallback, which will happen, handle the RPC or timeout rejected. And this is the last resort. Like if everything went to hell, I want to disengage. I want to get out of the place where I am uh, so that I don't get uh, fired upon. So this is the last resort, which you can see the, by this log record. Um, and I'm again using a policy wrap. So I'm using the last resort. Again, this is outermost, most than the correction fallback if I couldn't get the correction. So I will try to reposition and the correction timeout so that I don't wait forever for the correction. Again, you could have implemented these timeouts using the, um, the uh, predefined uh, deadline uh, values, like 
in with the gRPC clients, uh, you can define deadline, which would be date time now, date time UTC actually UTC now, and then um, uh, add milliseconds and say, all right, I want to uh, get this request uh, timed out like with a throw the gRPC deadline exceeded within 100 milliseconds, right? So this this would be a, a timeout which is built in into the uh, gRPC client. But for the sake of example, right, we are not using it and we assume that our clients do not have a way of uh, defining timeouts on their own, so they are using unlimited timeouts, which some Times is true, or uh, you could use the predefined timeouts, which are used like everywhere with, uh, say, HTTP requests or gRPC requests or queries to the database or whatever else it is. But sometimes this default timeout, which is used system-wide, isn't good enough for you. You need to you need to timeout faster. That's one of the cases where you would use the timeout policies, as uh, you saw in this example. So again, I'm defining a policy wrap with the timeout innermost fallback then and the last resort outermost policy. And then this policy wrap executes the get correction request. Um, important thing is that it would throw if cancellation is requested. That's what you are doing as a part of the um, of your uh, cooperative cancellation thing, right? Uh, because you need to use the, the cancellation token and then uh, make sure that you actually throw. You are not required to throw at specific place. You're actually not required to throw anywhere. But if you don't, then uh, your optimistic timeout policies will actually wait until your task is finished, which is not something you need. So if your optimistic timeout policies do not work, make sure that whatever you execute within your policy is actually use, utilizing the, uh, the cancellation tokens and utilizing it well. And this cancellation token, which we are supplying here, is just additional one, which, which helps us to get a manual control over the policy and not just wait for, for a timeout every time, which might be handy, might, might be not, depends on your very specific edge case. Um, all right, so that's what the fallbacks are. And that's what are the that's what the optimistic timeouts are. Um, finally, I wanted to to show you two more um, policies from Poly and the way I'm doing uh, faults. I will do my best to um, keep it short. Um, so we did all the firing with it. We we managed to execute the assault commands. Right now, we need to do a battle report to tell our division control that something went well, or didn't. Right. So we will do the battle report. Um, and this command doesn't take any parameters here. It logs quite a lot. Um, while it does the logging, let's see how it is implemented. So battery battle report will do the following thing. Um, it, for every single howitzer which is still in the battery, which wasn't abandoned uh, at the very first state, we will um, execute a task, uh, which is a battle report task, and we'll wait for all of them to finish. And that task will do the following thing. Um, we will define an inline circuit breaker exception, uh, circuit breaker policy. Um, and um, sorry, we will define an inline the retry policy, which will happen when the circuit is break broken. And we will also define a circuit breaker policy. What 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 that is? So assume you have tons of requests to some third party or to uh, your database server or um, just a lot of requests to execute something, doesn't really matter what exactly. And you know that, like you can see that some of them, say five of uh, 10 are failing. There is no sense to uh, try f next five, right? Because you know that they will most likely fail. Um, so what you can do is you can use the circuit breaker policy to reply with an exception right away, not even try to execute it this way you will fail fast, you will reduce the load in your system and probably some of the downstream services. And you will also protect the upstream services because they don't have to wait for too long to, so that like for, for you to reply, right? Um, so you, you know that it will fail anyways. So you'll just break the circuit and at some point you want to get the circuit closed again so that you can again try to execute those commands. I will try to show that with a diagram in a second, but this is basically a preemptive fault, right? Um, and this retry says, I want to wait and retry forever with the decorrelated jitter back off strategy. Um, I will try to send those, those reports of mine um, up until I am done with all of them. 
Um, and again, we define the policy wrap with the circuit breaker as in, in our policy and retry forever as outermost. And as a part of the, uh, the same policy, we're doing execute async for each of them. Uh, we are just sending the battle report to the gRPC server. So that's what happens as a part of the client side. And if, say, um, based on this circuit breaker policy definition, uh, we will see that mm, doo -doo 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 -doo. we define it as, as follows. We will handle any RPC exception and we will use the circuit breaker policy for it. We will, ex we will allow two exceptions before breaking the circuit. We will break the circuit for two seconds. After two seconds, we will try the next um, request. If it doesn't fail, we will close the circuit back, which is circuit reset. And then um, if, and, and this like this state when we are allowing a single request to see if it works is called half open. So that's, that's the half open. The reset means that that's, that request sent during half open, uh, half open state was successful. And we will break again if there were two exceptions. So that's how the circuit breaker works. Um, and uh, let's see the logs. Uh, what actually happened. So you can see based on the um, log records that first of all, we're trying to send uh, from each howitzer, uh, we're trying to send three parts of the reports simultaneously. Um, and you can see that circuit got broken um, and we got uh, an interesting exception saying that resource was exhausted and bulkhead says hello. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then you can see that with the same exception, um, all the remaining first attempts were failed. And then next time we try the first attempt after like during the first retry attempt, we're getting a different exception that circuit is now open and is not allowing calls. So maybe our third party is already good, but due to this duration of break for two seconds, we don't allow to send any more calls up until it's, uh, it's done, right? Uh, now we have our half open circuit. Um, Apparently I made a mistake here. Anyways, so the circuit is half broken. Uh, we try to send the first part of a report for a fifth, um, uh, for a fifth uh, howitzer. And then we get an exception again and circuit gets br broken again, right? And then this will happen up until half open um, gets successful, right? And that's where your circuit reset happens. After that, we are sending more and more and more, and finally our reports successfully uh, reach the, um, the third party. Now, how the third party is, is implemented and how it simulates the faults. Um, let's take a look at the division control service and specifically at the battle report. So you notice, you probably notice this uh, bulkhead says hello, here it is. Um, it leads us, us to another policy, which is very useful when you want to protect your resources. Say whenever a request comes in, um, and it could be again, anything, like it could be a business logic invocation, it could be a request to the database or whatever it is. If you have to do some heavy lifting, um, then you probably want to protect your service because you don't want to execute too many simultaneous things, right? Otherwise you'll get, you, you will uh, have problems with um, uh, memory. You will get problems with CPU. Uh, you probably will be out of available sockets or th something like that. So for that reason, uh, what, what you could do is you could define a bulkhead policy, which looks like this way. So we say, all right, I want to define a bulkhead async policy, which allows to execute two uh, requests in parallel. Um, and it also allows you to enqueue another one, the third one, uh, but all the others starting from the fourth will get the, um, will get rejected and the bulkhead rejection exception will be thrown. Um, this is what we will log every time that the uh, bulkhead rejection happens. And you can see that it happened quite a lot here, right? Um, so you'll see that this policy uh, within this policy, all we do is we just execute task delay for three seconds. So every time the battle report comes in, it gets into the bulkhead policy, checks if there, if there is an available socket, if there is an available place, right, to, to get executed. So two tasks can be, two requests can be executed simultaneously at the same time. 
two of them will do task delay for three seconds, third one will wait in the queue, and the fourth one will fail with the bulkhead rejected exception. Here it is. This allows you to, again, fail fast, prevent you from resource exhaustion, um, and this way your service will live longer, though it, it still will provide the best service possible, right? Uh, it will protect uh, itself and the downstream services from getting overloaded, getting out of resources, out of memory, out of sockets, um, uh, maybe even getting completely down. And it will, it will fail fast. It will let your, um, your client your upstream services or, or um, any other consumers of your service know that, hey, uh, you can't put so much pressure on me. Uh, you will have to wait um, or you would have to retry later again. Um, so that's how we are simulating this, uh, this problem that you saw. And that's actually how you solve it on the client side. You, you can do retries, but just make sure that you configure them well enough, uh, not as I did that. <laughs> um, all right. Finally, what I wanted to show is how, uh, like during all this demo, I was simulating various faults. So we saw that uh, we got timeouts, we got exceptions. Uh, one, one way of, defining, of, of doing that is basically this, right? Uh, the, the bulkhead for the last example that I had. But for others, I was using the monkey policy, which is a part of the SIMI project, uh, which is a uh, polycontrib NuGet package. Um, and this basically allows you to um, create chaos policies. For example, this is a registration latency uh, policy, which was used for uh, every request which, which we saw, uh, which we did to register our artillery unit with the division control. So what it says is whenever uh, something gets executed within this policy, we will inject latency um, over two seconds um, with an injection rate 100%, which is, and this policy will be enabled when I have like static counters. Um, so basically every, every fifth request will be successful. All the, all the others will get this uh, in, in injected latency, right? Um, the same story is for Meteo, um, getting meteorological data, um, same story static counters, injection rate 100%, and we enable this policy only when specific condition happens. Usually when you do your chaos test thing, right, when you try to see how your system performs, you wouldn't do this, right? You wouldn't do every specific request fails, right? Uh, that's what I needed for the purpose of the demo. You would usually say enable um, like always maybe, right? Uh, or depending on a specific setting on your environment variables or somewhere else. Um, and you will use the um, injection rate, um, which is say 20% or 10%, or which would look like this, right, or, or this. Um, again, this is still using the same interfaces, right? So you can inject various policies here, or you can use this policy whenever you need it, which helps a lot uh, during your experiments, during your uh, testing, resiliency testing. Um, and this is very simple approach, which is like bare bones, right? Uh, which you can employ for uh, various kinds of testing of, for, of different scale and complexity. Um, the, this was one of the policies, the inject uh, latency, right? But what, we all, uh, el what, what else we can do is we can inject exceptions. Um, again, the same story. So we will say, I want a policy which can inject exceptions and I want them to actually throw a fault, throw an exception. Uh, every like for for seventy percent of the requests, that is configured as simple as it is. Finally, um, you can also uh, do the um, inject behavior, which could be anything that you want. Let me just find where do they have it. Um, all right, here we have. So remember the firing we did for a howitzer, right? Every howitzer uh, could get overheated. So that's what we did with the monkey policy um, with behavior injection. So every 5% of uh, fire requests, what we did, uh, like fire method invocations, right? What we did, we said, all right, uh, we will inject this policy, which is enabled. And like every 5% uh, percent of uh, 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 this executions um, will, will uh, get the overheat uh, flag set to true. Um, and then, that's how we used it. So we had a policy and we used it for every single, um, uh, like we had 40 ammunitions per howitzer, right? So 40 times within that, um, we used this policy to execute the firing command. 
So again, this is as simple as it is. As you noticed, I am using these policies very recklessly, uh, meaning I define them in line, I define them in, within the registry and then resolving them through inversion of control and um, a container, right? Um, so I'm doing that all, the, uh, all over the place. Uh, and I don't really care about um, threads and asynchronous uh, invocations because policies, all of these policies that you've seen today are thread safe. So you can and you actually should reuse them as much as you can um, because in many places that is the only way to use them correctly. Specifically when you're using circuit breaker, you want to make sure that uh, all the requests to a specific endpoint or to a specific service go through the same circuit breaker so that it increases the, uh, the, the, the correct internal counts so that circuit could be broken or, or, or closed again um, um, corresponding, correspondingly to what happens within your system. Um, any questions so far? None. All right, let's do a little recap. So we saw the fallback. The fallback when to use, obviously, when you have a fallback strategy, any, right? If you know what to do if something went wrong. Um, though, keep in mind that it doesn't really matter what this delegate actually does, that you're fall, falling back in or that you're executing on fallback. Um, it doesn't matter, right? It could be a request, a DB database query, or something else, anything. Um, finally, the circuit breaker and, and the bulkhead. So circuit breaker, um, again, the closed state, everything is fine. Your requests are flowing. Your your execution of the delegates works fine. And then something went, something goes wrong. You get uh, like you exceeded the maximum capacity of failures. Then your circuit gets open. Nothing works. You get fail fail fast strategy in place. Like any time you try to execute something within the policy, you just fail. Um, then after a timeout, you'll get to a half open state when you will allow one request to pass on and execute the logic within the policy. If that is successful, your circuit gets closed and that's when you actually can execute everything again, right? If that request fails, however, we are get back to open state. That's where still nothing flows and we wait for another timeout to again, get to the half open state. When to use this when you have tons of requests to the same destination within a short period of time. This is very useful. Um, when, what to consider. Usually we work with the distributed systems, right? So you have several, several, several instances of your application, like you can have scaled um, like three instances, four or five, whatever it is, right? Then if the circuit breaker is defined locally on each and every one of them, it might not be as effective as you want it to be. So you might consider defining a distributed circuit breaker. It makes it, it like, if implemented correctly, it is way more effective. However, there is a lot of additional complexity and interesting questions on how do we do this? And you can read more about it uh, by the link right here. I will share this, um, this presentation afterwards. Um, because one of the important questions on how do we decide if the distributed circuit breaker should be closed or open, right? Uh, because then if we say that anytime we exceed the um, capacity of the circuit breaker, we should just break it, right? Then one uh, malicious uh, instance of your application, right? One, one, one broken instance of your application could just automatically fail all of them, right? Which might not be correct. Um, Finally, uh, the bulkhead, right? Um, simple thing to, like simple way to think about it is you have some execution slots and you have some queued slots. Um, in our example, it was two execution slots and a single queue slot and requests get to those slots. If they're not, if they're available, we will just place a request to the slot and either execute immediately or wait in the queue. If all these slots are occupied, we will just respond with the, with the exception saying, okay, we're not able to process this, so we are just failing fast. When to use this? When request handling costs a lot of resources. It might be memory sockets or CPU, doesn't really matter. The advice, don't use this blindly. Measure what is the comfort zone of your applications in appropriate environments and under the appropriate load. Because otherwise you're just guessing and when you're guessing, you usually don't do anything good. Finally, the testing with Simi, when to use this and when to use these monkey policies. When you want to test your 
regular policies that you use in your production uh, environment when you want to test your services or even entire system for resiliency, though this would take additional uh, effort of configuring them and defining like and, and configuring uh, the uh, test environments and more and more and more, right? So this would be more expensive, but this can lead to very interesting findings. And finally, like whenever you're in mood and in mood to experiment. Just see what happens when some of the endpoints do not reply in time or fail with an unexpected exceptions. I think, and, and like, I believe that these policies with SIMI and with the poly, uh, they present a very interesting pattern, which when incorporated into your system from the beginning, or at least at some point, will help you to discover new facts about it and about how it operates, and also will help you to reduce load on the downstream services and applications, as well as protect the upstream and your own. So um, I guess that's all I have for now. The further learning could be found right here. You'll be able to find it in the uh, presentation. I don't think that I have shown anything new. It's all of it has been in the industry for a while. I would strongly recommend to go through the learning uh, docs from Poly and Simi NuGet packages and Poly Contrib has a lot of uh, community, community powered uh, NuGet packages which you could find useful. I would recommend to go through the um, architecture patterns by Microsoft. They have quite good explanations, sometimes too lengthy, but still is interesting reading and I would suggest you do that. And finally, regarding Poly and why all of this is important, uh, there is a nice talk um, done by Brian Hogan at NDC conference, um, if I recall it correctly, at the beginning of this year, which I would strongly recommend to go through. Um, it goes with a slower pace than I'm talking right now, and I'm hoping that it will be easier to, um, to, to, um, to understand, um, at least, though it provides a little bit less examples. All right, um, nuggets which were used, obviously poly, obviously poly can trip with the simi and wait and retry, uh, gRPC nuggets for communication between client and service, the dependency injection with Autofac, and some additional things like um, the common.net for a console application um, being on steroids, just kidding, of course, and the fake data generator, which is bogus. Um, and finally, the coordinates calculation, um, I can't say that I recommend it right away, but because I just tried, I just started to play with it, but it was quite convenient. All right, that's all I had. Any questions? So um, your uh, bulkhead policy, it basically allows you to um, set up like a very localized throttling mechanism, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, would you would you recommend it to uh, throttle your say per pod uh, requests, uh, or would you use some other technique? So the usual answer and the easiest answer it depends, right? Because you can do distributed bulk heads as well, right? Um, the simplest way is of course do it per pod, because at the end of the day it's your pod resource, it's your pod who who has the resources, right? So unless you have some transitive dependencies and the transitive dependency like the, say it's a third party which doesn't have a bulkhead for some reason um, and doesn't protect their own resources and could get overwhelmed, right? Unless that is the case and you control everything within the chain of request, I think using the localized like per pod bulkhead should be good enough. But again, you can define the uh, distributed bulkheads um, though it definitely would raise a lot of additional questions like, um, is it okay that uh, one pod um, just prevents all the others to stop operating at all? All right, thanks. <laughs>